Okay, let's start the inflation uh, session. Okay, uh, so uh, this is the inflation panel. And we have Mark Kevinkowski, Justin Corey, and Rosie Murray uh, as our panelists. And I thought I'd uh, start out with a few of the questions that they're going to address and uh, some of the questions that came up in the very nice presentations in the morning. So, um, that, uh, inflation as part of the highly successful Lambda CDM model that we've been all talking about is sort of a victim of its own success. It predicts uh, nearly scale invariant Gaussian adiabatic fluctuations, all of which are beautifully consistent with the data, and I would argue is a, a prediction that uh, inflation has successfully passed. Uh, but is it a, like the other aspects of Lambda CDM, is it a victim of its own success? So, uh, what if the next generation of experiments see no gravitational waves? No non gaussianity no isocurvature, no interesting higher point functions that tell us about the particle physics of inflation. Uh, so one of the questions that um, I think everyone would agree that that does not falsify inflation, though there might be a debate about that, I think probably the more interesting question is what sort of non-observation would cause the proponents to rethink? And I think we know the answers for some of the proponents and we heard Andres excellent talk this morning. I'm sure you would never give up. Anna <laughs> has already given up, and there's going to be a range of opinions here, and I welcome discussion after uh, panelists uh, present their thoughts on uh, the related issues. So I guess the broader question uh, encompassing that is, uh, is the inflationary paradigm itself falsifiable, not specific models? Um, and then beyond the, what we are going to be measuring in the next generation of experiments, the power spectrum is exactly accurately, the higher point functions of large scale modes, what other aspects of inflationary physics can be observationally probed? We heard some very nice talks this morning, Peter has said talk on reheating. What are the observables that we can uh, use to understand the physics of inflation beyond these large scale modes that we're testing now? Um, and then, uh, sort of the meta questions. So, how fine tuned are the initial conditions that lead to inflation? And as we go down in R and not detect anything, is this problem going to get worse and worse? We heard some uh, nice uh, talks about that this morning from Raphael Flagger, and uh, Anna was talking about the uh, uh, converse side. And uh, suppose we don't measure R at the 10 to minus 3 level, is that going to make it much harder to? get generic initial conditions to inflate, do we need new ingredients to uh, make that happen? Um, and then uh, related to that is the measure problem, that is how do we address the measure problem in inflation, uh, or do we even need to address it if we're claiming that inflation passes the predictivity uh, of this uh, adiabatic, nearly scale invariant spectrum? Is that a success of inflation, or do we need to address the measure problem to even claim that? And that might lead us to think about rethinking naturalism, naturalness, like we heard in the last panel. That is, uh, are, are we on the edge of living dangerously? Is, is, is the tuning and non-naturalness uh, pointing to rethinking naturalists, rethinking whether we could be living on the edge of being dangerous? And I think uh, Justin will address that. We also heard a talk from uh, Sam Pasagri about uh, whether his instability occurred provide clues about the dark matter through primordial black holes you know, this morning. And then, uh, is inflation itself in, is in the swamp land? Uh, is it in the swamp land? Uh, whether uh, having a metastable to sitter uh, vacuum to uh, give inflation is something that is uh, compatible with string theory ideas, whether uh, it can be UV completed in a theory of gravity. Uh, and related to that, are trans Planckian modes censored? Is, is, is there a limit on uh, inflation due to not uh, having transplantable modes observable? And Roshi Curry is going to speak about that. So, with that, uh, let's start out with Mark Yankowski. Uh, <coughs> Please. 
Hello? Okay. about the cosmological constant, he was actually, he was asking, how should we feel about the cosmological constant? <laughs> and I think that opens a whole new dimension for our field, and I have to say, you know, when I booked the Southwest Airlines ticket, there was that little box that said, is this professional or personal? And I checked professional, but I'm finding now that it's turning out to be much more of a personal journey. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you in a few slides. Um, how I feel about inflation. <laughs> I want you all to open your hearts as well as your minds <laughs> to what we'll be saying. So, inflation is an ambitious theory. It's supposed to explain everything in the universe. It seems to do pretty well. Um, this is an example of um, perhaps our most precise measurement, that of the cosmic microwave background fluctuations. Um, now from Planck satellite, as well as an assortment of ground-based observatories. And it turns out that the theory fits the data very, very well. So what we do is we take the power spectrum of the measurement, which is essentially the amplitude of the Fourier modes, and we square them, and we find that uh, <coughs> there's this very sophisticated theory. It's not just a line, it's not just a, a parabola. There's a lot of structure here. It goes up and down, up and down and all the data points fit the, the theoretical curve very, very well. You don't even need the theory curve to guide the eye, and if we didn't have the right curve, you could see the whole thing going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So, there are a number of things that are striking about this. One is the uh, precision, and the uh, precision of the agreement, um, the, the remarkable agreement between the theory and the precise measurements. Qualitatively, um, there is power at L less than 100. So there are fluctuations on scales that are super horizon at the time of recombination. And that suggests that there is, um, you know, there was, a, there was super causal, sorry, super, um, super horizon physics in the early universe, something that co uh, connected causally disconnected regions in the early universe. The other thing that we often don't mention is we also measure the monopole. And the monopole is greater than 100,000 times all of the smaller scale structure. In other words, to a first approximation, cosmic microwave background is ultra smooth. So this is, um, tells us that something involving super horizon physics had to occur in the early universe. Um, when we take this Fourier transform of the cosmic microwave background, more precisely the spherical harmonic transform, we find these spherical harmonic coefficients ALM are all statistically independent. They are consistent with being selected from a Gaussian distribution and there is no M dependence. So the cosmic microwave background is consistent with Gaussian and statistical independence, not sorry, Gaussian and also statistical isotropy. So for example, one way you could parameterize departures from Gaussianity, although not an exhaustive way to do so, um, suppose we were to surmise that delta T over T, the temperature fluctuation in a given direction, was equal to some Gaussian random variable T plus some small parameter times T squared. What we find is that this correction over here is less than one part of 10 to the four. And so if you plot this, the measurement in Gaussian curves are the red and the black curves, which you can't tell the difference between. So it is remarkably Gaussian. It is statistically isotropic. There is no obviously special place on the sky. There's some cold patches, there's some hot patches, but all of these are consistent with these um, random fluctuations that you'd expect from a Gaussian map. That, though, is something that can be explored and might be interesting to explore. There's also the power spectrum. So if we take the amplitude of Fourier modes in the primordial density field and measure them, they are consistent with the power law distribution, or power law power spectrum, k to the n sub s. n sub s turns out to be very close to 1, but it turns out to be different from 1, which is nice, because that is 2 independent observations. It's very close to scale invariant, 
but it's not precisely scaling right. This is something that we've learned over the past decade. So why is this all interesting? So all of this can be accounted for if we simply postulate, for some reason, that the early universe, the energy density in the early universe was dominated by the vacuum energy associated with the, the, the displacement of a scalar field from the minimum of its potential. So here are two toy models for an inflaton field and an inflaton potential VFI. And all we simply surmise is that at some point in the early history of the universe, the energy density of the universe was dominated by the vacuum energy associated with the displacement of the scalar field from its minimum. That then accounts for the Gaussianity, the power law, the power spectrum, P of K, um, K to the N sub S, N sub S close to 1. It accounts for the adiabaticity of the primordial perturbations, which I didn't explain. It also accounts for the statistical isotropy. There's one more prediction that this um, scenario makes that has not yet been um, tested experimentally, and that is the existence of B modes in the primordial um, in the CMB polarization pattern. So inflation predicts that there are primordial gravitational waves, and it predicts that if we measure the linear polarization pattern <coughs> in the sky, at some point we should see um, B modes, a certain handedness in the polarization of the, sorry, um, patterns that uh, cannot be, uh, that look different than the reflection. Um, and the CMP polarization. We don't know what the amplitude of this gravitational wave background should be, or the amplitude of this, um, this uh, tensor to scalar ratio R. Um, but the simplest theories, those that I showed you, these cartoon models, the ones that we put in our textbooks, in those models, the gravitational wave energy density, or the amplitude of these B modes, should be proportional to 16 times epsilon, where epsilon is something that parameterizes the departure of n sub s from 1. Eta is related to um, something else that's related to the second derivative of the potential. But generically, for potentials that we would draw, cartoon versions, epsilon and eta should be comparable. And if so, then 1 minus n sub s is greater than 0 0.014. And so r, roughly speaking, should be greater than 10 to the minus 3. And some people are now trying to develop B mode experiments that will target the gravitational wave amplitude as small as 10 to the minus 3. <coughs> Now, with or without the B modes, um, this simple scenario, this cartoon version, offers a lot of questions. So first of all, what is it that set the initial conditions for single field slow roll inflation? If this is the true theory, how is it that that scalar field came to dominate the energy density of the universe? Um, what is that scalar field? Um, why is it that the scalar field potential is sufficiently flat to allow inflation to occur? long enough. So in order to actually have a slow roll, that platonic potential has to be reasonably flat. And there's always the obvious question, which is that you know this simple scenario seems to work, but is there a completely different paradigm that we can ever ask, um, might be developed to explain the measurements? So to me, single field slow roll inflation is a very successful model, but it is not the whole story. Um, to me, it is analogous to what we went thought of um, quantum mechanics back in 1925, or before 1925. So before 1925, um, for about half a century or more, spectroscopists were measuring lines from all different kinds of atomic transitions, or they didn't know they were atomic, atomic transitions, they just saw the different elements emitted different spectral lines. There were encyclopedias filled with tables with all these different lines and all their frequencies and wavelengths. So we had tons of experimental data from you know, a good fraction of a century of atomic spectroscopy, um, the first patterns in any of these were recognized by Balmer in 1885, one of two papers he wrote. Um, and then these features were first explained almost uh, you know, a good fraction of a century later by Niels Bohr in 1913. After Niels Bohr, people seemed to realize that you might be onto something, and so they developed, started to develop um, kludges to allow his theory to exp expand it to explain more observational phenomena. So the Bohr quantization was something that Bohr simply postulated to explain the Balmer series and some of the other spectra. But there were additional kludges that were then added over the next um, decade. There was some, um, Sommerfeld's generalization with the Pauli exclusion principle, the gatzmann uhlenbeck spin hypothesis. Um, Einstein postulated the A coefficient, and there was also the Broglie's wave hypothesis. And these were interesting ideas, but again, all of these were pulled out of nowhere. And then in a very short period of time, <coughs> In the few years after 1925 and into the early 1930s, it was, became clear that a new theoretical framework, a new paradigm, quantum mechanics, which then merged with special relativity, quantum field theory, could explain everything 
than before, and simply just been postulated ad hoc. And this is how I think we are, this is where we are now in cosmology. Um, fortunately, we now have a lot of data. We have millions of numbers from the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure. We have prospects for additional data with um, galaxy surveys within the next decade, perhaps beyond. Uh, we have this very successful but simple model, inflation, but it's pulled out of nowhere, and it also has lots of collusions. In addition to the questions that I already raised, um, the model that we have that works postulates some kind of collisionless dark matter. We don't know what it is. It's something new beyond the standard model. And it also postulates a non-zero cosmological constant or dark energy. And again, we don't have a very good understanding of what that is. So fortunately, there are lots of things that we can do to try to find chinks in the armor, perhaps go beyond the standard single field slow roll paradigm, answer some of the questions that we have about the infoton and the infoton potential. We can look for non-Gaussianity, departures from statistical isotropy, fossils from other fields. We heard something about that, these things in the morning. Um, small scale power, which I think is an intriguing question to ask, which we generally don't hear a whole lot about. We can check for parity breaking, there's bumps and wiggles that people consider, and transplanking effects. So very briefly, this is the map, simulated map of the cosmic microwave background with isotropic power, but it's conceivable that you might have a map in which there was more power on one side of the universe than on the other side of the universe. The temperature, the mean temperature here and here are the same, but the fluctuation amplitude is bigger on this side than it is over here. And in fact, depending on who you ask or what precise question you ask, um, it does seem that there is in fact more power on one side of the universe than there is on the other side of the universe. If one asks, is this um, a statistically significant departure from the null hypothesis of a statistically isotropic map? The answer is no. But if there are, you ask other questions, for example, is there a departure in, from statistical isotropy simply at the lowest L's, then it's not quite so clear. Um, if this statistical, if this departure from statistical isotropy is actually there, if we take it seriously, it is something that cannot be accounted for in single field slow roll inflation, as it would require a modulation of that infoton field over a very large, um, very, very large amplitude across the observable horizon. Um, we heard a bit this morning about galaxy clustering signatures of couplings of infiltrons to new fields. Most of that discussion was in, um, in terms of the bispectrum or three-point correlation function, but Dong B. Jung and I have been exploring um, alternatives in which the coupling to higher spin fields is manifested geometrically in the four-point correlation function. To give a four-point correlation function, you can actually decompose scalar, vector, and tensorial um, contributions, the contributions of coupling of an infoton to a scalar vector tensor field um, geometrically. Um, and this is an interesting question. Um, we have measured, as I said, the power, primordial power spectrum <coughs> consistent with the power law k to the n sub s, with n sub s equal to 0 0.968. But we've done so over only three decades in distance scale from the cosmic microwave background large scale structure. So this is the power spectrum, the matter power spectrum that we usually see plotted. But the prediction of inflation is actually that matter power spectrum should remain close to scale invariant over 15 to 22 decades in distance scale. So I think it's an interesting question to ask whether we could ever infer or measure or constrain the primordial power spectrum over those 15 to 22 additional um, decades. And some of the things that people are talking about to try to do this are 21 centimeter fluctuations from the epoch of reionization. Um, spectral distortions, mini halos, primordial black holes, lensing, etc. I've always been intrigued by parity. Um, elementary particle interactions are parity breaking. We believe that inflation is related to grain unification, unification of the fundamental forces, so it's interesting to ask whether um, parity might be broken on cosmological scale, scales. And there are ways to look for that, for example, by looking for the um, signatures of chiral gravitational waves or signatures in EB cross correlation to the cosmic microwave background. People have also been interested in the possibility that the infoton potential <coughs> might be, might show feature, have features, might be it's not perfectly smooth. So for example, axiom monogamy is a model in which you have a gumball machine type spiral, but the gumball machine is twisted slightly, um, tilted slightly, and the infoton is the gumball. How do you guys feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> So there is the primordial power spectrum for a uh, standard scenario, and if you've got an axion monogamy, you might have bumps and wiggles in the infoton potential that gives rise to bumps and wiggles in the primordial power spectrum. 
And maybe there's local features in photon potential. Maybe there's some kind of break. And if so, that gives rise to small scale features. I show this plot here simply because I'm very proud of it. I actually made that plot myself. Um, so I'm going to close with uh, one thought. Uh, if you read about the history of biology and genetics, you'll find that Mendel first discovered the laws of genetics, well, not the laws of genetics, he, uh, he did work on pattern, um, he, he understood that there were patterns of heredity um, that be, could be determined in terms of genes on off type switches. And he did this work in, 19, in sorry, 1865. It was close to a century until Prick and Watson discovered the fundamental microphysics, which you might say, or microbiology, that explained genetics work. So I think that right now, the model of inflation that we have is analogous to Mendel's, and I'm kind of curious to see if I live long enough to find the microscopic origin um, for inflation. To see, I don't know what to find. <laughs> I'm happy if anybody here finds it. <laughs> More happy than you. <laughs> More happy. But um, I'd kind of like to see, um, kind of curious to see if I'm going to live to see the microscopic origin for inflation. Okay. us with uh, finding pressing questions for inflation. So I'm going to phrase it as pressing opportunities. And these are not conventional questions I think that we would normally pose for inflation, but I think they're actually very fruitful. The first one I think is the striking simplicity and minimality of our universe, in particular particle physics. Uh, as we've heard, you know, the Higgs, of course, completes the standard model, uh, but as of yet, we don't have any clues or hints from the LHC as to what stabilizes the likeness of the Higgs. A natural byproduct of low-scale supersymmetry are WIMPs, and we have yet to discover WIMPs. On the gravitational side, the vacuum energy uh, or cosmological constant remains steadfastly immune to any compelling theoretical solution, natural solution. And on the experimental side, as we've heard, uh, things are getting increasingly tight in terms of deviations and deviations from GR. So why is it that things are so parsimonious in our universe? Also, why is the universe nearly critical? Okay, so a disturbing consequence of the Higgs and nothing else up to some high energy scale uh, is the fact that we discover, so one can compute the Higgs effective potential out to uh, large field values and you discover that the Higgs is metastable. Uh, we live in this tiny sliver of metastability. Now the time scale is nothing to worry about. It's uh, 10 to the 500 years. Um, remarkably, it's parametrically larger than Hubble. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an incredibly fine-tuned uh, answer, okay? You don't need to change parameters very much to get a time scale of order a second, or absolute stability. So it's a delicate cancellation between the space-time volume of our universe and, uh, and some particle physics components. I think this kind of conspiracy is not an accident, that's my own opinion, and really begs the question, what is the purpose of our universe to be so precariously close to an instability? Now, as an amusing fact, I think it's interesting to note that other fine tunings that we worry about can also be thought of as problems of near criticality. The weak hierarchy problem, the Higgs mass being close, very close to zero in fundamental units, says that the electroweak scale, electroweak physics is close to a second order phase transition. The cosmological constant, although less precise, but equally visceral, I would say, the fact that the CC is so close to our universe being Minkowski is again a quantum critical point between two very different uh, asymptotic solutions with the space times. And of course, last but not least, in the early universe, the primordial spectrum, as Mark said, being very close to scaling variance is at least suggestive of near criticality. And the solution that we all invoke is slow roll inflation, which of course itself is a phase of near conformal invariance. I think to me the near criticality of our universe suggests the statistical physics approach and a natural framework to realize the statistical physics of universes is the landscape. What I'm going to argue uh, in this third presentation is that the near criticality of our universe may be related to critical phenomena in the dynamics on the landscape. So indeed the landscape, uh, we think, uh, is allowed by the fundamental theory, which consists of many metastable vacua of different vacuum energies. Uh, and the question is, how this, did our vacuum get selected uh, dynamically? 
If this leads to eternal inflation, then we have to face the measure problem, which I think is the most important critical theoretical problem, worse than the CC problem, which I'm happy to discuss. Uh, it's crucial to make predictions, and the basic idea is that in an eternally inflated universe, you'll form universes of all types, infinitely many times, so you have to find a way to take ratios of infinities to make finite predictions. It really goes to the heart of being able to make predictions in inflation. And of course, it has a long history. Many people, including people in the audience, have thought very hard about this problem. I'm going to take for concreteness a specific approach, but it illustrates uh, the idea of how I think one should think about uh, this landscape dynamics. So imagine you're an observer standing still in the universe and willing to wait for a very, very long time. Okay? So you're just standing still, and initially you're in some vacuum. Now as time goes on, eventually your vacuum will undergo some transition, and further along it will go other transitions. Okay? So you're just standing still, but in the landscape you're doing some random walk. You should think of landscape dynamics as precisely some random walk process. In fact, you can just forget about the landscape altogether. Just think of a network of vacua, and you, as a watcher, is performing a random walk on this complex network. Now, fortunately, there's been, a, of course, random walks on graphs goes back all the way to Einstein, even before. But in the last couple of decades, graph theory and network theory has really witnessed an explosion. And that's because of the large data sets and applications to a wide variety of fields. In fact, we're very lucky in cosmology because this landscape dynamics couldn't be simpler. It's just a linear Markov equation, okay? Where f sub i is the probability at time t that you're in some vacuum with some transition matrix. So anybody can solve this. So the, the heart of the problem is not the, com the, com the complexity of the problem, it's how to interpret the solution and what to focus on. Now in the standard approach, uh, which has been for a long time tried, is you focus on the late time stationary distribution of this Markov process. You wait a very long time and you reach some stationary distribution, which will be the zero mode of your transition matrix. And the hope is that among all the possible hospitable vacua, a vacuum like ours will be somehow generic. This is known as the principle of mediocrity. Uh, however, one must be uh, concerned that this assumption of waiting to stationary distribution is a, it takes very, very long time, exponentially long time, because the landscape has, is very rugged, so it has, you know, you're going to get trapped in false vacuum for exponentially long time. So it's really like a glassy system. Relatedly, from a computational complexity perspective, the problem is NP hard. Okay, finding vacuum within some hospitable range is NP hard. Now, in graph theory, as a general statement, is the important question of centrality. Which node, if I give you a network, would be the most important in a suitably defined sense? So one way you can define centrality is with degree. So if I give you a network, okay, with some links, you can ask which node has the most links pointing to it. That's degree. And in this case, it would be the dark red, and the second one would be this light red. Okay? A fancier algorithm is page rank where you say, I'm not going to care about who links, but also whether important nodes link to me, okay? And whether they link just a few of those or many, okay? So that's Brin and Page's uh, great idea. And in this case, you see that the second most important node is this one. Despite the fact that it only has one link, it has a link to a very important node. In fact, you can play this game with academic citations, okay? So these, these guys did this, okay? So if you think of this network as physics papers, okay, with a link is when you have a citation from one paper to the other. And of course, if you just look at citations, which we just do, okay, that would be the total degree of a given paper, how many links point to it. But you can do something more sophisticated. You can type to rank paper by page rank, and that's what these guys did. And it's a very interesting exercise. I, I can spend a long time talking about this, but you find gems, okay? You find papers. These are the top 10 Google ranked papers by page rank. And you find papers that have very few citations, relatively speaking, like Slater's Determined paper, which is very famous, only has 100 citations. Okay, but its Google number is only twice smaller than than uh, Kabibo's paper, which also is not super cited, by the way. Okay, but so it's very interesting. So papers that we would all agree are important by page rank, that's a faithful representation. By citations, okay. So for tenure people, people who are in the tenure committees, okay, you can start using more sophisticated methods. <laughs> um, by the way, okay. So all the proposed measures, in any case, are one of these centralities. I'm going to focus on what's called closeness centrality which is nodes that you can reach in the fewest number of steps, okay? So it's like the, the, the nodes that control information flow. So to that, we have to discuss first passage statistics. So if I give you a, a network, uh, the key ingredient for us would be the mean first passage time. 
So you take some original node i, some final node l, and you average over the time it takes you to get from i to l, average over all the possible paths that connect the two. That's the mean first passage time. And then the mean first passage time to a given node j is some weighted average of this mean first passage time. And this particular time turns out to be gauge invariant, so it's time or parameterization invariant you can show. It's also independent of initial conditions. Okay, so it's some kind of measure of how long it takes you to reach that particular vacuum. And so you can define a measure based on how quickly it will be uh, to reach that vacuum. That's the basic idea. It's a closeness uh, measure. Now, if you fo focus on a particular region of the landscape that has, say, n vacua, so I'm going to focus on a particular region, okay, some fiducial region, you can go ahead and average this mean first passage time. This turns out to be a famous quantity in random walk theory. It's Kemeny's constant. Uh, this is unimportant. It turns out you can nicely express it as a, as a spectral sum. But what we'll use for our discussion is the following fact, that in transitions, when you have Coleman de Lucha transitions in the potential, the transition to go down is exponentially, has a rate which is exponentially larger than the rate to jump up, if that makes sense. Jumping up is exponentially suppressed. So if you just neglect these upward jumps as you transition in the landscape, you can show a nice result, which is that this mean first passage time is given by the sum, or the average rather, of all the time you spend at each node in this network. Okay, so it's the mean residency time for this network. It's a very simple result, and this is what we'll use. Okay, so the basic idea is the following that uh, in a typical region, if you just pick a random region in the landscape, such region would be highly rugged. It would have glassy dynamics, aging, and so forth. So as a result, if you're searching in this region, it will take you an exponentially long time to find vacua that are suitable, okay? And, and as a function of the number of nodes, this will scale exponentially, compatible with the empty heart class of the problem. There will be, however, exceptional rare regions that will look like this in which every vacuum in the region has at least one downward jump allowed. So it's a funnel, okay? So if you're in a valley, then the rate to go to the, to the bottom of the valley can scale polynomially in the number of nodes. In fact, this is nature's solution to the protein folding problem, another NP hard problem. So proteins fold very nicely and efficiently because they were naturally selected to have energy landscapes that look like a, like a funnel, like this. This is known in biology as the principle of minimal frustration. And there's another story I could tell about deep learning. There's a very similar story that networks that train well and are easily generalizable also have very smooth funnels. So and that's another NP hard problem. Like that. Okay, so so far we've treated this fiducial region as a closed system. In reality, of course, it's embedded in a much larger landscape. So if you're a random walker and you hit the golden region, you hit paradise, you want to make sure that you're going to sweepingly explore that region before escaping. You don't want to miss the nice vacuum up before moving out. Now, in principle, this would require modeling the environment and the, the probability to escape and so forth. Instead, we impose a proxy requirement, which is a requirement of sweeping exploration, which is that random walks in this region should be recurrent in a way that I'll define. Okay, so you should, it's, a, it's a proxy for basically sweeping uh, as much as possible in your exploration. So let me talk briefly what a recurrent random walk is versus transient. If you have a random walks come in two mutually exclusive classes. Recurrent walks is if you start at a given point, you're going to come back eventually to your initial point, and you will do so therefore infinitely many times. A transient walk is one in which you start, but eventually you may come back a few times, but eventually after some time you're bound to escape. A famous uh, theorem in random walk theory is by Polya. Uh, which show, who showed that random walks in D less than or equal to 2, so 2 is critical dimension, they're recurrent, but in 2 greater than 2, in 2 plus epsilon, in fact, they're transient. They escape to infinity. You can see here, you come back to infinity, you come back to your origin infinity many times, but here you tend to escape. It's a co-dimension. It's just a co-dimension idea. In fact, he came up with the idea when he took he took walks in the park every evening, he met the same couple every night. And he started wondering mathematically what was the probability that he kept running into the same people. And that's how he came up with this theorem. In fact, it led mathematician Kakutani to quip that a drunken man is bound to find his home, but a drunken bird may be lost forever. <laughs> uh, anyways, you can work out uh, some quantity that will capture recurrence. In fact, it remarkably coincides with this mean first passage time, which we computed earlier. So what you want for recurrence is for this quantity to diverge. 
Now, it's very nice, okay? Because if you think of it, diverge in the limit, this, this region becomes infinite. That's key. So there are two competing requirements that one comes up with. You want to minimize this quantity, okay? This means for a passage time for finite n. But as you let n goes to infinity, it should diverge. And therefore, it should diverge in the slowest possible way. It should be a logarithm, or perhaps something even slower than a logarithm, but let's just say logarithm. This kind of uh, logarithms, of course, is indicative of criticality. And in this case, it's a form of dynamical criticality, where you're dynamically, you're at the threshold between two dynamical regime recurrence or transients. So dynamical criticality in general is the statement that if I have a dynamical system that has a parameter over some range can be ordered, over some other range can be chaotic. The critical, the transition between the two is a critical point, and it's known as this dynamical criticality, otherwise known as edge of chaos. Uh, there's some very, very nice story I could tell about dynamical criticality is related to maximal computational capabilities. Okay, so that's been known since Wolfram in the 80s. So there's some computational power that you gain if you lie at this critical point. But most interestingly, it's everywhere in nature. Okay? In fact, it's here in our brains. And the reason is, so here's zebrafish. Okay, so they take a larva zebrafish, it's very nice. Put the larva zebrafish, they paralyze it. Okay, paralyze it, and then they stimulate it with some light to stimulate that it's swimming. So these neural, these neural avalanches that you see, these, this activity is when the when the fish is swimming, and you see these nice scale invariant power laws in response in the swimming. Okay, and it's very it's clear why the brain should react in this way. If your brain were ordered and you stimulated it, then the neurons signal would decay exponentially. And that would not be good. Um, and conversely, if you stimulate it and the whole brain lights up, it's a chaotic response, and that would also be bad. In fact, epilepsy is a form of dynamical chaos from the point of view of the brain. Okay? Uh, in fact, with artificial neural networks, people tune these specific kind of recurrent neural networks. They're tuned at criticality. You see that uh, the, some measure of performance peaks when the Lyapunov exponent vanishes for this system. The, most, the nicest example is the flocking behavior of birds. So these birds, they act like spins. They have almost nearest neighbor interactions. One bird interacts starlings. They interact with seven or so nearest neighbors. And nevertheless, they're a critical system. You can show that the correlation function in their velocity perturbations is scale invariant. In fact, it's almost, it's one over r to the point two. Okay? It's almost logarithmic uh, as a scale, of, a scale like the size of the birds. They're like spins. Now, you might say this is just Goldstone's theorem, okay? This, this system is breaking rotational invariance spontaneously, so maybe scale invariance is a consequence of Goldstone. What these guys do, they actually check also for correlation functions of the speeds, like the Higgs field, which you would expect not to be scale and it's also scale invariant. And the evolutionary, the evolutionary reason why birds are in this configuration at this critical point is of course that if you have a predator that comes and hits the flocks, then the flock is going to be maximally susceptible to react and to adapt uh, to the predator. So in our case, uh, you can show, coming back to our dynamical criticality, um, you can do a nice calculation, which is to show that this, you want this quantity to diverge, but minimally so. In the continuum limit, you can show the following result, that it will diverge if your vacua have a, a, a time scale, a lifetime, which is of order, it happens to be 1 over h cube. This, surprisingly, is the page time for these vacua. Okay, so this is completely unexpected, but it's the page time that comes up. And in this case, indeed, you can show that this mean first passage time diverges logarithmically. So quickly, you can do a little, a little bit of phenomenology. So we'll remember this uh, stability of our vacuum. The page time for our universe turns out to be 10 to the 130 years, given the present value of Hubble. This is not so far from the uh, standard model estimate, okay? Um, in fact, you can see this is interesting because the, the, the metastability answer is not Hubble, okay? It's parametrically up above Hubble, 10 to the 500. Here with the page time, you're in the right ballpark. You can make it nicer with the, the depending on the top pass or with massive neutrinos, but Supersymmetry. You don't expect supersymmetry, low-scale supersymmetry. Why? Is if you discover low-scale supersymmetry, uh, what could supersymmetry do? Okay. Naturally, it should make either it pushes you in the unstable region, which is impossible. Okay. Or it brings you to the absolute stability point. It will never leave you in this unless you exponentially tune. It's exponentially. It's not going to leave you in the metastable region. 
Okay, so as a result, if you discover no scale SUSE, it would basically rule out this mechanism. Okay, so I would say that's why, I mean, that's, maybe that's too strong, but okay, it can be controversial. That's why we haven't seen a, a, a low scale SUSE, is because of, now, the way to think about this is that we're not solving the CC, but this would say, given the measurement of Hubble, given the CC, I'm predicting something about the weak scale, something about the Higgs, which ensures that the lifetime is of this order. So it's linking the cosmological constant with Higgs scale physics. Okay, I'm going to end with some final thought. You mentioned biology, I mentioned biology. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think these are different notions of typicality. In biology, uh, in, in cosmology, we would like to say, principle of mediocrity would say, anywhere on the landscape that is somewhat hospitable, we could live. In biology, instead, outcomes tend to be heavily fine-tuned and nearly critical. And it turns out that pinch time, in our case, comes up to be uh, in these funnels. So some provocative questions, perhaps. I think uh, the particle physics questions are interesting. Okay, so we've already said uh, Higgs metastability is something that potentially can be explained in these kinds of uh, constructions, no low scale SUSY. And there are other things that could potentially also be explained, like the, the strong CP scale, which doesn't have an anthropic reasoning. Uh, and the proton lifetime also is not anthropic, is way above any anthropic considerations. So the, 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 the fantasy here, to be controversial, is that search optimality, the fact that we live in these special regions of the landscape, could it somehow explain the simpleness, or the, the simplicity rather, of the, of the particle physics we observe? Why we only see three dimensions. In proteins, when proteins fold, uh, the dimensionality of their configuration space shrinks. Okay? The, as you go down in conformations, the dimensionality shrinks. But it means that something like that is also happening in moduli space as you approach uh, these particular regions. That would explain perhaps why we only see three spatial dimensions and, and not more. And most interestingly, it, regarding inflation, is new ways of realizing inflation. So to me, for what it's worth, when we write down a potential like this, we're, we have to tune the slope, and that's akin to an experimentalist tuning the temperature to be near critical temperature for an Ising spin system. Okay, that's the, that's the same tuning we're doing. Except that it's not experimentalist, it's the theorist that's, that's doing the job. Okay? But in this case, could there be new types of dynamics, non-equilibrium dynamics, that may give rise to new inflationary mechanisms? That, that's another uh, fantasy. Okay, I'll stop here. In quantum field theory, without gravitational degrees of freedom, it is generally believed that we can write down any low energy effective theory and expect, expect that it has a consistent ultraviolet completion. The only requirement is consistency that one can check in low energy. For example, all gauge anomaly must be cancelled. This is what the Wilsonian view of the renormalization group tells us. However, the situation may be different in theories with gravitational degrees of freedom. And indeed, there are non-trivial constraints that are not obvious in low energy. One such constraint says that quantum gravity does not have global symmetry. We can easily write down the low energy effective theory with global symmetry. But, oops, don't, uh, somebody touched the, uh, yeah, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not up to you. <laughs> Even though you are the chair. <laughs> I have the microphone. <laughs> so, so, one such constraint is that uh, uh, quantum gravity does not have global symmetry. We can easily write down the low energy effective theory with global symmetry, but it cannot be exact symmetry in full quantum gravity. Any accidental global symmetry in low energy has to be either broken or gauge symmetry in disguise. Daniel Harrow and I have recently completed a proof of this statement in the context of ads cft correspondence. We have also proved the completeness hypothesis, which states 
that all possible charges with respect to long range gain symmetry must be realized. Logic we use to prove this theorem does not rely on string theory. We only assume the ADS-CFT correspondence, which we believe should be applicable to any consistent quantum theory of gravity. In 2005, Kumran Baffa proposed a swan plan as a set of effective field theories that seems consistent in low energy, but cannot be viewed derived as low energy approximation to consistent quantum gravity. Swamp land condition delineates the border between the swamp land and the landscape. Over the 14 years, over the last 14 years, several swamp land conditions have been proposed with various degrees of rigor. So you can see that a horizontal axis goes from useful to useless, and the vertical axis goes from rigorous to speculative. And as many things in your life, things rise on the diagonal axis. <laughs> As I mentioned, the absence of global symmetry and the concreteness of gauge representation have become clear by my work with Harold. The weak gravity conjecture and the distance conjecture strengthen and quantify this theorem, as I'm going to discuss now. Weak gravity conjecture states that in any effective theory described by Einstein gravity coupled couple to Maxwell field, if it has a consistent ultraviolet completion, there must be a particle with charge Q and mass M, such that M measured in the Planck unit is less than or equal to the absolute value of Q. String theory has no continuous free parameters. All parameters can be varied locally. They are expectation value of scalar field. The distance conjecture Kuran Buffer and I proposed in 2006 is about property of the moduli space of such scalar with a metric defined by their kinetic terms. The distance conjecture state, one, the moduli space is non-compact. Pick any point x, you can go infinite distance away from it. It also states that compared to the theory at x, the theory at y in distance much greater than the Planck scale has a power of light particle with exponentially small masses namely masses suppressed by the exponential of the distance between x and y measured in the Planck units. The low energy effective theory defined at x breaks down at y because of these new light degrees of freedom. Though the weak gravity conjecture and the distance conjecture have not been proven rigorously, over the last decade these conjectures have successfully passed a highly non-trivial test with a large variety of Calabria compactification. Logical connection between these conjectures and other conjectures, such as the cosmic censorship hypothesis, have been formed. We believe that these conjectures are applicable to any consistent quantum gravity, not restricted to string theory. So far, however, tests have only been done in string theory since it is the only theory in which reliable calculation can be done. These swamp land conditions have stronger implications on low energy effective theory. As I mentioned, as I mentioned, the no global symmetry theorem does not tell us how symmetry should be broken or gauged. The concreteness theorem predicts magnetic monopoles, but it does not tell us how heavy these monopoles are. The weak gravity conjecture and the distance conjecture strengthen and quantify these statements. So let me give you one example of this. So Daniel Haro, as I said, Daniel Haro and I showed that no, the no global symmetry theorem applies to spontaneously broken symmetry also. For example, if there is a low energy effective theory with massless scalar field with flat potential, the theory has a symmetry which shifts the value of scalar field by a constant. This symmetry is spontaneously broken in three or more dimensions and the scalar field is a Goldstone field in this case. Our no global symmetry theorem prohibits such symmetry even if it is spontaneously broken. Therefore, this shift symmetry must be violated at some point. My distance conjecture with Qumran quantifies how it is violated. If the value of scalar field shifts much more than the Planck scale, the low energy effective theory must break down by the power of exponentially like particles. 
The only potential counterexample to this distance conjecture I'm aware of is the axial monitoring model proposed in 2008 by Ian McAllister, Eva Silverstein, and Alexander Westphal. Therefore, I would like to take this opportunity to explain why it does not make a counterexample. To make sure what I'm going to tell you is fair to those who have worked on the action monotomy, I discussed it with Westphal, who is a co-inventor of the model. In fact, he and I worked on this part of the presentation together, and he approved of the remarks that I'm going to read now, so it's best. <laughs> Over the past decade, several, people, uh, several papers have appeared pointing out that transplantian excursion in the axial monotomy may become difficult once we take into account modular stabilization. In fact, recent study based on some explicit, semi-explicit examples have demonstrated that back reaction there is already important in sub distances. Typically, the model contains both action mode and the radial mode. As we go around the action direction, the back reaction to the potential starts to move the radial mode and eventually destabilize it. The radial mode starts running away toward the large volume limit, shutting off the monotropy excursion of the mod uh, action mode. At the same time, this runaway of the radial mode generates a power of light paluzacline mode. This behavior is consistent with the distance conjecture. To circumvent this program, the f term axial monotropy inflation was proposed by several groups in 2014. However, paper by Irene Valenzuela and her collaborator in 2016 and 17, followed up, followed up on by earlier paper by Baum and Party in 2016, showed that f term monotropy also suffers from control issues if a hierarchy of mass scale cannot be engineered. A similar program for models with D7 frame was pointed out last year by Liam McAllister, who is a co-inventor of the axial monotropy. In the paper posted last December, McAllister and his student reported that moving D7 brain induces the D3 brain charge, and that resulting back reaction may preclude large field inflation due to what they call a dramatic effect on the superpotential, even in one period of action field. The distance conjecture is an asymptotic statement and is applicable for a field range parametrically larger than the Planck scale. So far, some model of action monotropy seems to avoid the instability within the field range of few times the Planck scale. If that can be confirmed in fully explicit construction, it would remain useful as an ingredient of certain inflation scenarios. Such model would not be a counterexample to the distance conjecture, since there is an order one factor leeway in the field range as for when the exponential behavior begins to set in. Let me turn to other low energy implication of the swamp land conditions. Three years ago, Kumran Buffer and I pointed out that weak gravity conjecture will have further implication on low energy physics if we strengthen it slightly by stating that equality there in, the, in this relation between mass and charges uh, holds only for BPS particle in theory with unbroken supersymmetry and otherwise the inequality should be strict. We found that this slightly strengthened version of the weak gravity conjecture would put restriction on the neutrinos in the standard model. Our observations have been examined more carefully by Ivanez, Martin Lozano, and Valenzuela, and by Hamada and Shu leading to the relation between neutrino mass and the density of dark energy that uh, I show over there. The force power of the neutrino masses must be bounded above by the dark energy density under some assumption on physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. Given that the variety of construction on low energy effective theory of consistent quantum gravity have been proposed and some have been proven, it seems reasonable to ask if there are constraints on the accelerated expansion of the universe. In the spirit of the title of this panel, let me pose the following question. Can one derive a low energy effective theory from a non-consistent quantum theory of gravity 
that accommodate a stable or quasi-stable digital space as its solution that explains either the observed accelerated expansion of the current universe or the proposed inflationary period of the early universe. Kumran Buff and I, together with our student Georges Opiero and Rex Polinienko, asked such a question and came up with a conjecture stating that if a Roy effective theory contains scalar field, either the gradient of the potential is bounded below or the minimum of its Hessian eigenvalue is bounded above. This conjecture, as well as a distance conjecture, does not exclude the inflation scenario, but they can put no trivial constraint on the inflation models. Since there has been proposal on top-down construction of quasi-stable digital spaces from string theory, in the spirit of this symposium, it will be appropriate to discuss them at this point. KKLT scenario proposed by Kachuru, Karosh, Linde, Trip, and Trivedi 16 years ago is one of the best efforts to derive for this stable digital solution, top down from string theory. It has also been the most scrutinized proposal. KKLT starts with an ant digital solution and then turned on supersymmetry breaking to lift the potential, aiming at creating a local minimum in the potential with small positive vacuum energy. Several steps in this scenario have been questioned, and their validity are currently being debated at various fronts. Rather than going into technical detail on these ongoing debates about KKLT, let me point out two fundamental difficulties one encounters in any attempt at top-down construction of this type from string theory. One is dyne zyberg program, and another is compactness of Caribbean manifold. So let me discuss each of them. String theory has no free parameters, and any parameter of low energy effective theory is an expectation value of some scalar field in high energy. KKLT requires that all scalar fields be stabilized and the expectation value be fixed. This means that if they succeed in what they want to do, there is no adjustable parameter in their model. Already in 1988, Dian and Zyberg pointed out that it is difficult, if not impossible, to find a quasi-stable state in the domain that allows a weak coupling expansion with respect to the string coupling constant. When the flux compactification was found to be abundant in the early 2000s, it was hoped, since there are so many of them, it may be possible to find a series of flux compactification guaranteeing smallness of the coupling constant by using fluxes as controlled parameters. Indeed, there are a large number of parametrically controlled flux compactification, which give rise to the landscape of anti digital spaces. Unfortunately, this idea has not been successfully implemented in constructing digital spaces. <coughs> Since controlled approximation has not been possible, it has been difficult to check claims made about such construction in reliable models. Let me turn to issues with compactness of Calabria manifold, the second point. In mathematics, programs dealing with compact geometrical objects are often more difficult than those with non-compact counterparts. For example, no one has been able to construct a rich flat Kera matrix explicitly in any smooth compact Calabria manifold, even though its existence is guaranteed by Yao's proof of the Calabria conjecture. In contrast, it is extremely easy to construct a rich flat Kera metric explicitly on a non-compact Calabria manifold. One of the reasons is that in compact cases, you cannot hide the program by pushing them away toward the infinity. Rather, you have to confront global constraint. These global constraints in compact cases in mathematics mirror the Swampland condition in physics. The connection is that that Newton coupling in the low energy theory vanishes in the limit when the volume of the Calabrian manifold becomes infinite. In the infinite volume limit, gravity decouples and the swamp land constraint disappear, taking us back to the traditional Wilsonian view of the renormalization group and the effective field theory, where we can write down any low energy effective theory 
and expect that it has a consistent ultraviolet completion. For a compact internal space giving rise to a non-trivial Newton coupling, we have to confront global issues over the compact manifold as the swampland condition emerges. Last week, I was at a conference on the swampland held in Madrid. Organizers of the conference took poll on several swampland questions. One of them was, do you think there exists any concrete string digital vacuum which are fully under control? So this result, as you can see, is obviously based on the biased sample. It is still striking that 98% think that Dojita vacua do not exist in string theory, either not now or never. I'm showing this to tell you that there is a group of serious scientists who have valid question on, claim to, uh, on any claim to have constructed Dojita vacua now. At the Strings Conference in 2019, in Brussels in June. Dian McAllister gave an excellent review talk <coughs> in support of KKLT, responding to a variety of issues raised about the scenario. Leaving aside the question of whether his assessment are overly optimistic or not, he agreed at the end of his talk that there has been no explicit compactification that unifies all necessary components of KKLT. Given that the KKLT is a proposal from, for top-down construction from string theory, it is desirable to have at least one concrete model to show how, how everything works out. When the bicep result came out five years ago, I was a deputy chair of the PMA division of Caltech. A few weeks before the official announcement in March, at one of our weekly administrative meetings of the division, Tom Sofer, who was a division chair at the time, said, that there will be a big announcement about primordial v mode polarization. I asked him what the value of R is, and he said 0.2. I told him right there that it cannot happen in string theory, since it would contradict with my distance conjecture with common. The bicep announcement prompted several string theories to go back to the actual monotony model and check its details, since it was the only way such a large tensor scale ratio could have been produced. Over the next decade, a variety of astrophysical experiments are planned for precision tests of inflation. They include the Japanese satellite project Lightbird to measure the primordial B mode polarization. As a director of the Cabri IPMU, I proposed this project to the Master Plan 2020 of the Japanese Science Council. Just a few <coughs> months ago, we had a wonderful news that the JAXA, Japanese Astro uh, Aerospace Exploration Agency, approved the launch of the light bulb in eight years. So we should improve our theoretical tools and strive to make more precise and sharper statements about low energy effective series of string theory and their implication on the current and early universes before the next astrophysical experiment verifies or falsifies the inflation in our universe or nails the uh, equation of state of the dark energy of the current universe. Thank you. So, uh, now I'd like to open it up to uh, panel members to comment on other panel members' thoughts. And while you're doing that, I will uh, put up some Questions that yeah, some prompt to my help because uh, we cover so many different things. I have a question. How did you vote? In the... <laughs> well, I was actually on my way to Madrid. I was attending some other conference. So, so when the survey result was uh, at the survey was announced, I was on the plane, so failed to vote for it. <laughs> But one thing I want to point out that at the conference, there are people who have actually proposed some Dojita construction, like John Conlon, who <coughs> proposed large volume scenario was at the conference, and Wati Taylor, who, was, who also wrote some paper on uh, landscape, etc., were there. So I don't know whether they voted, but uh, there are people who are advocating construction also. So these were not like a bunch of weird people. <laughs> 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 I 
Was it it was, it was, yeah, so I said it was a bias <laughs> sample. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that the Hubble would have a straight scope. So while we're about in Mark, when, what value of R would you uh, start rethinking inflation? What would be your answer yes. to the question two? Uh, I think below 10 to the minus 2 makes me nervous, below 10 to the minus 3. Um, the way I put it is that if you know, we get to R of 10 to the minus 3 and we don't see anything, I think we have to rewrite the textbook. Well, but, but I heard from Andre this morning that that won't falsify inflation. So what, what do you no, say? No, it's not a question of falsify or not falsify, but um, we do draw these cartoonish potentials. And uh, we're not going to be able to do that anymore. We find that R is less than 10 minus 3. Simple potentials, yeah. Are you inviting Andre? I'm inviting Andre to comment. You can send him a microphone. I guess we, we are going to learn quite a lot about inflation until this experiment will give you an answer about 10 to the minus 3. So uh, probably a decade to wait or two until you throw out everything down to 10 to the minus 3. Maybe we'll find something on the way. It is uh, correct that among the, the present models of inflation, uh, the best ones which we know now they predict uh, R between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus uh, 2. So if we find them, it is, it's great, we will be all happy. On the other hand, uh, the, what, the two classes of models which well, are most favored by Planck, which are known for quite a while, they all do not have any implicit uh, bounds on R from the law. So, Either you just say that these models are wrong by construction, but because we have a sort of plan and, uh, uh, well, saying that these are the best models which they uh, favor, uh, I'm just saying that these models, they don't have any bound or bound or not. So would there be other ways to falsify inflation? Oh, there have been already <coughs> many, many ways. But somehow they have not been mentioned, but uh, inflation have been in the near-death experience several times in its life. And each time when it was, well, kind of survived, uh, survived it was later quickly forgotten. Uh, uh, like, uh, the one thing was about open uh, inflation, because uh, at some stage it was said that the inflation is ruled out because omega is equal to 0.3. Now, even before that, I remember that in 82, when we just they invented the inflation theory in 283. Uh, uh, Novikov, who was a collaborator with Zierdovich, came to Lebedev Institute and said that the inflation theory is already ruled out because in order to produce galaxies at the chute, uh, the perturbations of temperature must be at the level of 10 to the minus 3, and they are not discovered, so inflation is ruled out. Then what happened that dark energy, uh, the concept of dark matter was uh, pushed forward and then it became much easier to make galaxies with much smaller fluctuations. So this was one first thing. And then the second was with this omega. I remember how I was present at the conference. Sorry for the long answer, but it's just, well, uh, I was at the conference in uh, Los Angeles where this dark uh, uh, energy was uh, about uh, supernova situation of the universe was announced. And I called my wife in another college who at that time was in IEPP. And I told her, look, it seems that Omega equal one is just well, here. And uh, she said, but I was just, uh, no, the next day, she said, David Gross told me, it is such a pity that inflation theory is finally ruled out. Huh? And, and they did not say, why? Well, because I just returned from the conference in Princeton where it was finally shown that omega is equal to 0.3. So unfortunately, inflation is finally ruled out. And then I said, no, but then they just called and say that dark energy is well found and everything is fine. And where are these conferences going to Los Angeles? Huh, I came from a real conference in Princeton. And they proved without any doubt that omega is 0.3. So next morning, the walls of his building were covered by papers 
uh, reporting the discovery. So this was another one. Uh, there was many similar statements like before one thirteen. There was a rumor that FNL is going to be reported at the level of thirty or fifty, and everybody were preparing to the death of 99% of all inflationary models or more, all string, uh, all single uh, field inflationary models would be rolled out. All students, all postdocs were working and inventing extremely complicated uh, models which would produce uh, well, uh, perturbations with large FNL two weeks before the Planck uh, data release. Uh, there was a lecture given by Paul Stanford in Perimeter Institute where he said that inflationary theory is completely unpredictable, but if it predicts anything, that it is small FNL. But our theory is absolutely predictive, and it predicts FNL 30 to 50. Two weeks later, there was a discovery at Planck, well, announcement of Planck, that FNL is equal to smaller than 5. Three weeks later, uh, uh, Stenker had written a paper saying that, yeah, we are well, uh, predicting FNL was small, well, just compatible with Planck. So it was several times that we were coming to the situation where everybody expected that inflation was going to die, and no, these are, well, for those who have not participated in it, then it was not an emotionally challenging something, and it was easily forgotten, simply unknown. That's why people ask so many questions about it. Whether, how many proofs and whatever, when you finally give up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the question to me, when you finally give up, this is not the question to those who challenge, it, uh, it will never uh, stop. But the questions were for me, when you finally give up, depending, undependable, because, and here, where, where is the theory of inflation? Well, we give the best uh, candidates of theory based on string theory, so where the fully complete string theory to play with it. We have this conjecture, that conjecture, and it's great. And string theories leave the field and go to study high temperature superconductivity. So it's great that uh, Aguri and Wafa uh, will hear and will study the real string theory uh, as not so many, uh, there are not so many talks on string theory per se, I believe, on the conference on strings. Now, uh, supergravity, we have models based on supergravity reported. So there, is some pro there are some problems of inflation, which are not the problems of inflation, but there are problems of the fundamental physics, which are not given to us uh, from sky. We had a hope on LHC that everything will be given to us. But money, the uh, absence of people, the problems inherent to quantum field theory, uh, to theory of fundamental physics, not the problem of inflation. When we are talking about measure problems, for example, uh, perhaps it's not quite certain or clear that uh, a substantial interest to this problem emerges because of the multiplicity of vacuum in string theory. So isn't it a problem of string theory? And then if there are not so many vacuum in string theory, then guess what? If you have many, many different complexifications leading to many uh, approved models of slump one, then probably there are many different models depending on exponentially large number of compactifications. So you have a landscape model of the minima, part of the dark energy scenarios. So then one way or another, until string theorists solve the problem of measure, which is inherent in all of their models, you will start to uh, continue asking why inflation did not solve the uh, measure problem. So why us? We all, it is all our common pain, and we are all trying to version it. Um, I have a sort of open-ended question, which is, we heard from each of you that there's a sort of a rich future to inflation from, uh, from Mark, it was that there's broad cosmological aspects to inflation to be tested, just in that there's aspects of criticality in the rest of particle, phys particle physics and the rest of science to be connected to, and then uh, from Hiroshi that the that you could um, that there's a rich future on the theory side. Is it a rich future because there's actually all these things to do, or is it 
are there all these things to do because we're kind of grasping at straws, that we have kind of no place to go, and so we're kind of desperate for anything to, to go to. So, sorry, I, I didn't quite understand the question. So, you all talked about very different aspects of the future of inflation. One on the cosmology side, one on the rest of particle physics, and one on the theory side. And they were all very broad and very different. And is that because there's a rich set of things that need to be done and that we can continue to do in inflation? Or is that because we're kind of grasping at straws to try to, try to understand the theory that we just don't understand at all? Well, from my point of view, I, I think uh, the Higgs meta stability is a profound hint on what happened to our universe or the early universe. And I think we shouldn't be shy, perhaps, to ask that maybe cosmology has something to say about this question, as well as the simplicity of, of particles. I think uh, I mean, we can try whether cosmology is the dynamics has something to do with it. Many people are working on it. Uh, so uh, in the previous, at the end, toward the end of the previous panel, uh, it was pointed out that it is very important to sharpen the top-down construction of inflation because that can give restrictions. So one thing I should acknowledge is that in string theory, we have very limited tool to study non-supersymmetric situations. We have very powerful tool to study supersymmetric situations, but those are not very useful for inflation where supersymmetry is all broken. So, uh, so there I have to acknowledge that construction is very limited. So, uh, so one, one of the, one of the uh, message I was giving in this talk was that uh, we should take uh, various claims made about construct, top-down construction of string, uh, inflation from string theory with grain of salt. So for example, the large number of string vacua in landscape that we often quoted as shown derived from string theories are all in unrealistic situations with supersymmetries. And uh, there is no, uh, so it's very interesting situation where we seem to think that there is a 10 to the 50 or 100 non-supersymmetric vacua when actually none has been constructed in any explicit cases. So, so I think that uh, uh, one has to be careful in inferring from uh, this idea, this uh, 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 speculations. Uh, and so I think one of uh, it's actually for it, in some sense it, it's a homework for us that the string theory should confront the fact that we are not very good at non-supersymmetric situations, and uh, and then come up with better tools. And uh, one of the reasons that Kumran and I have been working on this is that because of these limited uh, 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 tools, we are trying to find other ways to find a pattern in the, uh, uh, ex from the existing, existing construction. Uh, I guess my question was, um, Related to you showed the slide that that basically half of these string theorists didn't think there were the set of solutions in string theory. So I guess you know inflation theorists always ask when they're going to give up on inflation. You know, how low does I have to go before we give up on inflation? I just wonder, you know, how, how long do you have to fail to find the set of vacuum before you give up on well, string theory? Well, so 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 uh, Mark pointed out that it took a century for a uh, Mendel's uh, model to to have the microscopic uh, explanation. And uh, it's already already like 20 years or so. Sure, but it's uh, dark energy has been formed, and I have to acknowledge that the string theory has not explored at all in this territory. That we, we have not had good tools to study. So so uh, it's, it's not said, it's not like uh, we cannot construct the uh, inflation top down. We cannot construct the data space top down. Even though 98 percent of people in this very biased conference voted. Uh, uh, for that state. Uh, the, 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 I think that uh, uh, we, have, we have very little, we know really very little about non supersymmetric geometry like the, the space for the string theory. And also, many of these uh, swampland conditions are asymptotic statements. So, at least the kind, the thing that I can say for sure, well, I have the, the kind of swampland condition that I have confidence of are asymptotic statements. And then we are sort of extrapolating. So in strong coupling regions that we have, we have very little knowledge of. So it's highly it's possible that there are some digital space construction there in the middle of the modularized space of string theory that we currently don't have access to. So those are very much like, for example, situation in the type of Mendel, we wouldn't have 
able to find the structure of DNA because we do have two. So I think it's very important to have more powerful mathematical tools to, to study, especially in these non-supersymmetric situations, rather than saying that, well, we have finished the job and constructed Vojita space. Then would a proof of the impossibility of the set of Ancula mean that string theory was out? I mean, given that we probably live in the set of space now. Well, so, so say it again. I, Oh, I, I just wondered if you could prove that you couldn't make this in a space in stream theory. I thought I thought not proved this at the level. Oh, of but the if proof. anyone did, I mean, suppose this proof existed. Just suppose someone came along with the proof that you could have made this in a space well, in stream theory. Uh, then would the would the string uh, theorist then? I I, I don't think, I don't think that, 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 that realistically in the near future we would have such mathematical tool to say one way or the other, and we would learn much more on our way to find such mathematical tool before worrying about uh, this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, Alan is uh, This is a question for Michael. Is Michael on? No. No. Turn on. What's that? Hello? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Justin. Uh, I have a little trouble understanding the real motivation for the kind of measure that you're proposing. Uh, I gather that the fact that you're talking about the measure problem means that you are talking about uh, eternal inflation. Yes. Uh, inflation that literally goes on forever. Uh, nonetheless, as I understood it, the crux of your measure was that you were looking uh, for vacua that are easy to find, that can be found quickly. Right. Uh, eternity is a long time. Uh, what's right. the point of uh, thinking that vacua that can be found quickly are somehow preferred? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think uh, the way I get, so there are different measures that have been tried, as you know, both global, <laughs> that you've invented and other, and then local ones. And, uh, and they have, in my opinion, each of them has their pros and, and cons. With the global ones, uh, they're, they're attractors, so they're independent of initial conditions, as you know, but they're not time reparameterization invariants. And with regards to the local ones, they are sensitive to initial conditions. Okay, so, so they each have pros and cons. So I think the guiding principle for me is to find some definition of a measure which would at least obey some set of rules that I think are, are valuable. We can disagree with them. So to me, time reparameterization or gauge invariance is important. Independence to initial conditions is another one. So in terms of these centrality measures, this closeness measure or the accessibility measure that I've defined uh, is one that seems to check all the boxes thus far. Now, of course, it has to be scrutinized and checked against phenomenology and so forth, but that is the underlying motivation. Um, now, one can discuss, but to me, uh, another ambiguity of measures that are based on, on volume or stationary measures is indeed whether you weigh with respect to co-moving volume or physical volume, and that's that, that's something that people have debated. That ambiguity is absent if you think in terms of the time it takes to populate to populate back. Yeah, I would disagree with you. Yes, I, I know, and then it has some other some other. I don't know. Okay, we can discuss. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm maybe saying the same thing Andre said because yeah. I didn't hear him. Uh, yeah. But I think things like uh, causal. Uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, scale factor, scale factor measure. time uh, yeah. measure are perfectly uh, time right. So, okay, right. I mean, so to me, the, I mean, this is a question we can discuss offline as well. But to me, measures that are based on the stationary distribution, of course, you can say I'm going to choose a particular time slicing, and that's going to be my favorite time slicing, like scale factor time. But to me, who decides what is the proper slicing to which with, the, with which to define the measure? I'm much more satisfied to first define a measure which is time reparameterization invariant, and then find predictions that this measure makes. But that maybe is subjective. Like I'm not satisfied with saying scale factor time is the right time variable because it agrees with observations. That, that once it's not time reparameterization invariant, I'm not satisfied. With. So regarding criticality and simplicity in the Higgs sector as a guiding principle, I just want to make a critical remark. 
uh, that uh, it's certainly true that the Higgs potential, if you just take the standard model at face value, it has this uh, feature that we live in a metastable vacuum, but that's only true if we accept the premise that I don't think anybody in this room actually believes, that there should be no new physics beyond the standard model that could influence the running of the parameters that define the Higgs potential. And so namely... Sorry, sorry, sorry let me qualify this. Yeah. Uh, this statement is not that there is no new physics all the way up, but in order to preserve metastability, there has to be no new physics all the way to some high scale like 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 13, whatever the precise value. And that I may be the only person, but I believe that, that there is nothing up to 10 to the 13 GeV. So, okay. that, so that's my controversial remark for the meeting, okay? I believe there's nothing there. <laughs> and the reason is that Higgs metastability requires such a fine-tuned accident, such a fine-tuned cancellation among things that have a priori nothing to do with each other. The space-time volume of the universe and some standard model parameters that are run all the way to 10 to the 17 <coughs> GeV. Why these two things, which are exponentially sensitive, conspire to give you a rate which is within some, some time scale that is reasonable, okay? That is not... That is, you know, it's 10 to the 500, but it's, you know, it's not infinity nor zero, okay? So, so, so to me, I believe, I, I'm willing to believe that. Okay, so fair enough, but I mean, it should be noted, though, that this panel is about uh, inflation, and so yeah. we believe that in the existence of at least one other spin zero particle, they can trivially sure. be coupled yeah, to the Higgs, course. right? So, yeah. uh, if, so if like I said, it's not that there's nothing, it's just that there's... In fact, just let, me, let me qualify this, can, can I just qualify? It's not that there's nothing, in fact, there could be other particles, but those particles should not affect Higgs metastability. That's my view. Higgs metastability is some, something that I view as sacred, okay, that's my point of view. And then, so there could be other, like an axion, for example, fine. An axon is totally fine, it's so weakly coupled, it's not going to change at all the stability properties of the Higgs potential. Sure, but the radial mode that uh, gives well, rise that, to that, then there's a constraint on if it's a U1 symmetry, then there's a constraint that people have developed, of course, yeah. I'm sorry I shouted because I didn't have my microphone <laughs> in my hand. Now, you don't need another scalar field. Just the Higgs. The only thing you need is a non-minimal coupling of that Higgs to gravity. That's enough to explain just the expansion from inflation as well as uh, if you follow my talk on Monday, dark matter in the form of primordial black holes. That's all you need. Actually, the values that are now being measured at the LHC, and I'm not talking about something weird, but really particle physics, suggest that the top quark coupling Higgs. That coupling is precisely compatible with having a perfectly stable vacuum. It's not even metastable. Mass something like 171.5. <coughs> and if that's true, then this new scale that would appear at 10 to 17 to 18 would be non perturbative Somehow it's given by the RG equations, which take you all the way to that point. I, I don't understand the statement at all. There is a difference between the Yukawa companies. There's a difference between the Yukawa coupling, that, that the fundamental Yukawa coupling, that you obtain from the top quark mass, that is the one that you use for the running in standard room, and, and the, the measured coupling of the Higgs to the top that may be affected by new physics. So if you interpret that coupling, that may be modified. So is that coupling in discrepancy with the one that you obtain from the top quark mass? That will, it's, that it's will, show, that will show new physics there. So, with the new physics? Automatically, because it's not consistent with the, with the one that you obtain from the top core mass. So it cannot possibly be, cannot possibly be that you assume the standard model and then you modify it by, by the observation of the LHC. That is a fundamental contradiction. If not, you obtain what is shown in the graph. Can I answer? Yes. So the top core mass, which is measured through cross-sections in the LHC, is something which requires understanding of QCD. It requires some kind of PCA type of Monte Carlos in order to extract from the data what is the top part mass. There are measurements which do not require this, which use directly differential cross sections and measure the Yukawa coupling. That's the point that you put in the RG equation. That's the one that takes. That is the cap that is not the Yukawa coupling, I'm sorry. That is not the Yukawa coupling. That is the coupling of the Higgs to the top that may be affected, affected by the particular like low energy dynamics. If not the UK coupling, the UK coupling is a fundamental parameter. Is there is a difference uh, Chiama, between I that coupling? An inflation pattern. <laughs> 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 you are discovering new physics if you Mike was raised this time.
that was a fantastically stimulating panel. Uh, let me see if I get the takeaway message. Um, first of all, it seems like everyone was saying measuring R is really interesting. And between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 3 is, uh, I hate to use the word sweet spot, but is a really interesting range and coincides with what can be done. I see head shaking. So that was easy. Then if I tried to get take away, <coughs> tried to figure out the other messages, uh, uh, Hiroshi said, um, stay tuned. Quantum gravity may give you some very strong constraints on possible inflationary theories. Is that more or less? It's more than probably well, okay. Uh, uh, Justin, I think, said we should think more broadly about this, that we should really think out of the box, although I'm slightly confused because it seems like everything you said was more about the multiverse and the landscape than about inflation, but did I miss something? It was, it was fantastic. I, no, I really enjoyed everything it. Everything is motivated, of course, by eternal inflation. If there's no eternal inflation, there's no need to talk about men. Okay, but it was largely about the, the multiverse. And, and then Mark came across as the conservative on the panel. <laughs> and if I understood what Mark said, um, what you were saying is, uh, you know, a fundamental theory is really important. Uh, and it may take a long time. Uh. A, fundamental theory, <laughs> a fundamental theory for inflation is really important. And it might take a hundred years. Yes. Yes, you that's what you mean by that? You mean microscopic theory? That's what you yeah, mean. Yeah, microscopic, or yeah. whatever word you want to use. So, did I get the panel right? Yeah, I would say I would say that um, sometimes I hear people say that you know our inability to answer questions about how inflation may have been started or the nature of the inflaton invalidates the theory. <coughs> to me, that's not true. Um, and. I think you know there's more to be learned, but it might take a while. It's just the nature of the way. Well, that's what I tried to say. Okay. Yeah, but, but the top level I, I thought was interesting because the three approaches uh, were so very different. But everybody said uh, measuring R is extremely important, and 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus three is uh, where you want to go. It's critical. Yeah. I'm not sure Justin said that, but I'm, I'm not sure I understood much of what Justin said. But it must have been, it must have been in there somewhere. I saw you shoveling uh, in the barn, and there must have been a pony in there somewhere. Okay. So, uh, no, no, you say okay. So, is Ferrex is uh, will be launched in 2023. We learned a few months ago that the NASA approved the mission, and that has the capabilities of detecting non gaussianity above slow rho, but below F and L plus phi. So if we make this conference in 2024, and we detect F and L of order one, but incompatible with slow rho, like what will you, what will be the discussion about? Like what will be like the, the new, um, you know, what we will learn about inflation and what will motivate you uh, with this new detection. Oh, if we find F and L bigger than one? Um, I think that would be very interesting. There are all kinds of models that do predict F and L bigger than one, um, but they all are involved in physics beyond single field slow roll. Um, so curvaton models, um, what are they called? Uh, models with uh, strange kinetic terms, DBI type models can predict large F and L. I think it'll be very interesting. Anyone want to address any of the questions that we've got? conditions, and one want to address the initial conditions. So I just want to make a point that when you use what you have, that is the standard model Higgs field, you can get R that is 10 to minus 12 because there's no V Higgs inflation. You couple the field non-minimally to gravity, but then you have to make a choice regarding the gravitational decrease of freedom. And 
if you make that choice, you can get tensor to scalar ratio as small as 10 to minus 12. And in a way, this is the simplest possible model of inflation because it's built on what we know exists, the standard model Higgs field. So I don't quite get this fuss about R being 10 to minus 3 or 10 to minus 2. You can easily go below that. <laughs> the statement that is that the Higgs inflation R is naturally very small. Is that the statement? It depends. Like in metric Higgs inflation, R is 10 to minus 3. And then there are alternatives to that where you can go down to 10 to minus 12. Number 10 to the minus 21, and we make it. Uh, we make it. Uh, if you see, if you predict, and um, a while ago we used uh, a Western ball to uh, to to see the gravitational wave, but it is there is a certain limit that we see some we, we can see something. Uh, if that observational strategy doesn't work, we need to find something else. Uh, I agree with you that uh, if we don't see 10 to minus 3, it is not necessary we need to rethink the theory itself. But I think it is necessary to search something something else more effective, effective to to see the uh, um, uh, 10 to minus 12. You know what I mean? What I mean is, demobilization is just one way to look at putting more of a traditional way. If we go down to 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4, we don't see anything. Uh, Chairman, don't you think it's about the time to bring the panel to a certain conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, my comment is, it is not necessary to restrain uh, our, our, our theory, but I think it is necessary to find something else to look for what we are looking for. Okay, I have a suggestion. No dinner until we solve the measure problem. 